Good morning. Peace be with you. I'm going to welcome us to worship at Granby Congregational Church. I want to especially welcome those who are online as well as here in person and want you to know that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. If you have an announcement this morning, you can come on up at this time. Um, and while they are coming forward, I'll just let us know that if you have a prayer request you would like uh, to share with the congregation, there's a form in the pew. The deacons will be picking those up during the first hymn, so make sure you write down your prayer request. There are plates in the front and the back of the sanctuary if you would like to leave an offering or your pledge to contribute to the ministries of our church, and we thank you for doing so. so. Good morning. There's a whole bunch of stuff that you can ask me questions about or see me about, including Cathedral in the Night, which is for youth and adults. It's a wonderful ministry out in Northampton. We make food, we worship with them on the streets. There's also youth group happening coming up. We're starting that again, middle school, high school. But I'm here probably for, I'm gonna say everybody who's watching later or watching online because I don't see any little kids. So this is for all you parents um, that are watching this service live streaming or later, that we have Sunday school starting next week for Homecoming Sunday, and we will have a fun cupcake walk for the kids and youth, and if we have leftover cupcakes for everyone here too, um, as well as a professional face painter. Um, so lots of fun things happening for the kids coming up. See me if you have any questions. Good morning, everybody. Good to see everyone. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that I am gonna be offering an additional yoga class um, here Tuesdays, nine to 10. The actual dates are, I think, in the newsletter and also online. So hopefully some of you will show up. Um, it's open to all, all bodies, all levels, all, all people. So um, I hope some of you come and try it out. Thank you. Awesome. Um, I love that during the week there are opportunities to connect with our bodies and spirits um, through those practices. Um, I'm also looking forward to homecoming Sunday next week. It means that worship will be at 10 a.m. Uh, you can come for 9. We will put you to work setting things up, but worship begins at 10 a.m. And this came up before worship. Is face painting also open to the adults? Awesome, awesome, yes. Um, in addition to you know the awesome potluck after church and face painting and the cakewalk, there is going to be our second annual all church photo. So we will be capturing our congregation next Sunday morning, which means tell your friends they're not going to want to miss it or else the photo we use for the rest of the year, they're going to say, where was I? Why wasn't I in there? Um, or I'll have to Photoshop in quite a bunch of people. So next Sunday, 10 a.m., homecoming Sunday, the house band will be with us. It'll be a terrific service. I also want to let us know um, there's a change from in the announcements for the storytelling group. They're not meeting this week, they're meeting on the 11th, Wednesday the 11th. So that is a change for this month. Um, if you haven't been to the storytelling group, I highly recommend it. They are welcome people, I've, I've witnessed, they welcome people to come and just listen to people's stories. And um, I will warn you that often what happens is people come and hear stories and then the next time they get a little braver and feel inspired to tell their own. So it's a wonderful, group on September uh, the 11th. So with that, on this Labor Day weekend, I pray that our worship will bring a spirit of rest and respite for us all. Let us prepare our hearts and minds as we enter into a time of worship.
Thank you, Asher. Good morning. Beth Matlack here with your Board of Deacons. Please join me in the morning's call to worship, which is um, from Psalm 15. O Holy One, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell in your, on your holy hill? Those who want to journey with you, who may have a turn, who may struggle with rocky patches and rough terrain. O Holy One, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? Those who seek and search for you and for community and doubts and hopes, joys and fears, smiles and tears. O Holy One, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? Those who try and those who sometimes give up, those who are basically wonderfully and terrifically hymns of us. Thanks be to God. Now join us in the um, first hymn, which is in the blue hymnal 464. Thanks. You may be seated. (laughs) 
Before, whenever we come to the communion table to receive the gifts of the table, before we do that, we always begin with a confession. A confession that we are human, that we are imperfect, a confession that we are still works in progress. We do this in a united voice so that we might also remember we are not alone in our humanity. So I invite us to unite our voices together in our prayer of transformation and new life. Holy One of leaders and little children, we hear your words every day, but rarely live them out. Our anger roars like a flooded creek, but our forgiveness drips like a rusty faucet. We listen with impatient ears to the cries of the poor. God of lights, may your mercy fall on us like a summer shower on your parched grass. May your hope overflow our hearts. May your beloved child, Jesus Christ, speak to us and call us to life. Listen and understand. The voice of the beloved speaks to us, implanting the word of hope, the word of grace, and the word of forgiveness into our hearts. We listen and understand. Every gift comes from God, especially the gifts of mercy and love. Thanks be to God. We are forgiven. Amen. Let us feel God's presence in our midst as we say to one another, peace be with you and also with you. Good morning. Please join me in our responsive prayer of illumination. Spirit of the living God, turn on the light of truth and wake up our hearts by the word we now declare and ponder. Let us find fresh life, fresh hope, and fresh courage for witness in your world. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment of his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. For your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness, and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and, on going away, immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues but deceive their hearts, 
their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. There are times when we read passages from the Bible or when we hear them read to us that it feels like we have so much interpreting to do that we're in danger of missing the intention and hope of the original writers. So we have to spend most of our time asking questions of cultural and historical context analyzing the origins of the root words, reinterpreting the God language, all to just translate it for our world today. We have to remind ourselves of who the Apostle James was, who he was writing to and what he was writing about as we attempt to pull out these few verses in the middle of a much larger book. But when James wrote the passage that we heard, I'm certain he didn't have any of that on his mind. He was focused about sharing a message about Christ to his fellow church members that would inspire them and challenge them and ultimately help them go deeper in their relationship with God. He never imagined the amount of head scratching and interpreting we would have to do before we could get to the good stuff. This contrast between what I imagine were his hopes and our reality so many years later reminds me of the classic 1960s novel, Stranger in a Strange Land written by Robert A. Heinlein. Has anyone read that? Of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so for those of you who haven't read it, it's a science fiction story about a human who was born and raised on Mars and is the only survivor of the first human expedition to Mars. 25 years after Earth loses contact with the original explorers, another ship is sent to Mars and they discover Smith, who is now a Martian. So they bring Smith back to Earth, and the book is the telling of how he must become acquainted with Earth's gravity and physical environment, as well as all the customs and relationships of his fellow humans. And one of the best things about this book is how skillfully Heinlein was able to capture humanities in ways that many of us take for granted, from interacting with others to how to breathe on earth to learning how to learn. Through this book, the reader is able to take a step back and notice for even just a few moments what it means to be a human in a particular time and space we get a chance to witness our basic level assumptions about Smith, the human Martian, as he learns them for the first time. In the book, as we embark with Smith on his journey to live into his human self, the way he goes about it doesn't flow quite as naturally as it does for those of us who were born and raised on Earth we see the clunkiness of his efforts. We see the absurdity of some of our beliefs and practices when we observe someone brand new trying to fit into our norms that we don't even notice are at play. So for example, early on in his time on Earth, one of his doctors asked Smith if he feels like breakfast. And Smith takes a moment to assess whether he feels ready to be eaten, which is what you do with breakfast. Even though Stranger in a Strange Land was written in the 1960s, the story could still be told with the same relevance today. Taking even just a quick snapshot of what it means to be human in 2024, It it would be kind of absurd to explain our world to an outsider, 
needing to adapt and thrive on earth for the first time. Would we, or we would be inclined to tell a different story than what someone new would observe, right? So for example, if someone were to come to me and said, I'm new here on this planet, what should I know? I would want to talk about all the things that we enjoy here on earth, how we love people, how we learn lessons, how we create art together. Yet if that person were to observe the world for even just a few minutes, they might think that I'm a liar. <laughs> There's evidence of wars across the, across the globe that wouldn't match the stories that I would want to tell. I'd have a hard time explaining away education systems that too often fail students and prisons that profit off the downtrodden and politicians who line their pockets and even religions that use their power to shame and divide people instead of unite them. Trying to explain all the complexities of our world would not only confuse a Martian among us, it doesn't make a lot of sense for those who live here already. After being steeped in our world for so long, the stories that we hear or that we might have to explain away no longer shock us. We're desensitized to the violence and numb to our daily conflicts and compromises. It's only when we pause to try to explain it to an outsider that we realize how strange it really is. It's only then that we realize in our efforts to be the humans we're called to be, full of love and generosity and compassion, we're sometimes at odds with how the systems of the world around us unfold and how they twist us into the worst versions of ourselves. So suddenly we start to feel like the human Martians, strangers in a strange land. This raises the question that the book attempts to demonstrate. Is to be human, to be unable to take care of each other and the world? Or does being human mean getting stuck in our differences and treating each other poorly? Or are we still just learning on the way? how to embrace our differences and each other in meaningful and life-giving ways. Is there still hope for us yet? That science fiction novel was grappling with the same questions about humanity and our hopes and how we might treat with each other, the same questions that the Apostle James was grappling with with his church. So James gives us a couple of nuggets of wisdom in this brief text from his longer letter. And if we pay close enough attention, the scripture clues us into how we can go about living more in tune with what we believe and value. In James's words, you must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness. How might our world transform if we all took a posture of being quick to listen and slow to speak? What would happen across the globe if we practice the art of being slow to anger? What if we spent more of our resources ridding ourselves of all sordidness or, in regular people words, nastiness and injustice? While this may seem like an enormous task, one that doesn't always feel doable, there's tremendous hope because of what James says right after this. Instead of letting the fear of our differences seep in and allowing those fears to shape our unpleasant responses to others. James calls on us to retrain ourselves to welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save our souls. Basically, James is telling us that we already have what we need 
to do the work of living harmoniously with strangers among us. We already have the seeds of God's love implanted within us so that we might truly learn to be quick to listen and slow to speak and even slower to anger. And when we forget how to access those seeds that are already at work within us, we have to look toward someone whose life and teaching show us how God's love looks in action. Someone who walked this earth a couple thousand years ago, a stranger even in his own hometown, who showed us what it truly means to be human, showed us how to be human in the godliest of ways, even as it went against the grains of his society. Someone who taught and continues to teach us how to love even when it's easier to hate. If we open ourselves up, we might hear the wisdom from someone who's continually drawing each and every one of us in all of our diverse complexities into God's abundance so that we, in turn, can be radical in welcoming others into that same abundant goodness. This is one of our challenges as a faith community that claims Christ as our guide. If indeed a Martian were to walk in through these doors today or any day, how might they make sense of who we are and what we do and why we do it? Would they find love in action? Would they discover a welcome that goes beyond what society expects of us? Would they experience God in and through their interactions with us? Would they listen to us and sit with us and sing with us and know, oh, this is what you stand for. This is what you believe. As people who know at some point in our lives what it is like to be a stranger in a strange land, I hope the answer will always be yes. They would know, they would recognize who we are. I pray that we can challenge and encourage each other, especially in times like these when the outside world seeks to, to change us, to harden us, to cut us off from each other, to learn and to see and hear each other through the strange and different ways that we express ourselves as the diverse human beings we are called and created to be. Empowered by the Spirit, James reminds us we already have within us what it takes to make it so. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we pray together, we lift up these prayers from our congregation. We're praying for Yvette, who's having surgery this week, prayers of healing and comfort for her, as well as wisdom and brilliance for her surgical team. We are praying with great concern and grief for all the children in Gaza. We're praying for an end to violence, that peace may reign on our earth. Are there other prayers this morning that we'd like to lift up? Awesome. We are praying for Lisa's boyfriend, Ralph, who, after a really long summer, is out of the hospital, out of rehab, and back at home with his family. So continued prayers of healing for Ralph and for strength and perseverance for his whole support system. Prayers for my housekeeper, Kendra, to take care of her personal issues. Prayers for Kendra to take care of her, is her personal issues. Um, yeah, we're surrounding Kendra with love. Yeah. Yeah.
Let us continue in the spirit of prayer together. Holy God, we read science fiction stories and we remember what it feels like to be a stranger in a strange land. We read ancient words and we wonder what it is that connects us to those people that came before us. And so we turn to you with open hearts, listening for your wisdom, for your hope, for your comfort, praying that through your presence, through your spirit that moves through each one of us, we will no longer feel alone, but we'll feel united as one people, united for peace, united for justice, united for love. We pour out our hearts united together in our prayers, lifting up the people in our midst, Ralph and Yvette and Kendra and others, praying that they will not feel alone in their struggles, that they will feel the support that surrounds them, the love that is radiating in their lives. We are praying for peace in every nation, every community, every home that is filled with violence. We are praying that all people may know safety, that all of our children may come home at night. We are praying, God, for the prayers, the concerns that have gone unspoken for the grief that we carry that feels too heavy to name, for the worries that keep us up at night, for the uncertainties that define our days. We pour out our prayers into the silence of the sanctuary and into our homes, feeling your spirit move amongst us. Christ among us, hear our prayers. Amen. On this weekend that we have set aside as a nation to rest from our work, we approach the communion table and remember that as we rest, the spirit is laboring today. Grace is rolling up her sleeves. We give thanks for the work of Christ who toils on our behalf. We remember that it is right and just to lift up all who water the earth with their sweat. As we come to the communion table, we remember that this table is open for all who are hungry. Whether you are a member or a friend, a first time visitor, whether you believe a lot or you believe a little or you're not sure what you believe, if you are here and hungering for a love that is bigger than any one of us as individuals, if you are hungering for justice and peace in the world, this table has been set for you. We are all invited to come and eat together. So let us prepare our hearts as we sing our communion hymn let us break bread together, found on page 425.
You may be seated. You remember the story from long ago when there was a group of disciples who were tired, who were weary, who were broken down by the forces in their world, by the act of living their lives with faithfulness. And so they gathered together for a meal with Jesus. And when they were sitting down, Jesus took bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat this, be refreshed and remember me. And after they ate, he took wine and he poured it out into a cup. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant that I have made with you, a promise that you will never be alone, that you will always be defined by my love. And having poured it out, they passed around the cup until all had drank from it. And so we do likewise, remembering the love that forms us. Please join me in their spirit, in the spirit of prayer. Wonder worker, we gather on land that does not belong to us, at a table we did not make, to receive bread we did not bake, to satisfy an ache that we alone cannot shake. We come tired from our own labors, overwrought and worn thin, to remember and receive the life-giving work of Jesus. Spirit of labor and of rest, may your presence rest here on this table on these gifts. As we receive them, may we also receive and celebrate all the labor you have expended on our behalf. Your creative love given freely without conditions. May we pray in gratitude, using the words taught to your disciples, saying together, O Holy One, who art in heaven, thy heaven be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As you are served this morning, you are invited to take a piece of bread and hold it until we have all been served and may eat together as a sign of our unity in Christ.
Let us eat. As we are served from the cup, we're invited to drink it as we receive it as a sign of our individual relationships with God. Please join me for our prayer of thanksgiving. Holy provider, grace made tangible, love in motion. We have received your gifts with thanks in our hearts. Be grateful for the labor that produced them. We promise we'll never forget the justice we owe to all people who work and work to repay them our debt. Amen. Let us rise in spirit or body once more as we sing together, Be Still My Soul.
Before, before our benediction, I just want to take a moment to thank our accompanists for the past six weeks, Asher. You have been phenomenal on the organ, on the piano, and also behind the scenes going, Asher has gone above and beyond what a fill-in accompanist should do, including was crawling around in the organ pipes this week, um, <laughs> helping our organ sing. And it has been wonderful to work with you. The whole congregation has just been thrilled. It has been such, um, to have the steadiness and continuity during this summer of transition has been a real gift to our congregation. So thank you, Asher. <laughs> and Asher keeps reminding me that he has his own church that he belongs to and participates in, but you are welcome back anytime. So. <laughs> With that, as our time of worship ends and our life of service continues, I pray that you remember that no matter where your journey takes you, the grace and peace of God will surely follow. Amen. Amen.